Our reading is from Revelation 3, verse 20. Here, all right, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Gifty, and uh, thank you, Janet. A uh, very short reading there. The reason for that will become apparent in just a moment. Um, but I wonder if you might cast your mind back um, to April 2020. Uh, we were in the first COVID lockdown, so if you're anything like me, you were learning loads of new skills, how to do maybe a Zoom call, how to um, not be on mute, how to bake sourdough bread, anyone else, or just me. Um, you were learning new words like social distancing and all that sort of thing. Um, but my daughter, Abby, had a very different idea of how to spend her time. Uh, she decided with her friend, Hannah, uh, to write a book. Now, the problem with that was that you couldn't be in the same room at the same time, and she doesn't really do technology either. And she wanted to write it by hand. Um, so this is the way they wrote the book. They, um, Abby would write a chapter at home, uh, out by hand. She'd then scoot over to her friend's house. Uh, she would put that chapter on the doorstep. She would knock on the door um, and then step back, keeping an appropriate distance. Uh, Hannah would open the door, uh, would then pick up the, um, the next chapter, uh, read it through, um, and then they would talk about it a little bit, uh, and then Hannah would set about writing the next chapter, and then she would scoot over to Abby's house, to our house, and they'd repeat the process, going back and forth, back and forth. And, and one of my memories of that period of them doing that was uh, just the look of joy and delight on their faces as they discovered what was in the next chapter. As, um, as they saw where, what was happening to the characters and where the story was going. And it was like they were kind of reading, but also writing. And it was, it was a wonderful mixture. And it, it brought real joy to them in what was a really difficult moment. Discovering the twists and turns of the story uh, brought joy to them. Why did I tell you that? Uh, well, go forward a few months from that, about 18 months or so ago, as we emerged out of the second lockdown, so about March... Um, March, April of 2021, um, I, I started to sense God speaking to me um, about St. Melitus and actually using, in a way, uh, the experience that Abby and Hannah had had writing this story. And this is what I sensed him saying, is that it was time for us as a church to write the next chapter. Time for us to turn the page and write a new chapter in the life of St. Melitus. Um, the world had obviously changed and is changing. Um, the needs of our community were changing. And I, I just began to sense the Lord saying, it's time for us as a church to explore how we might need to change in response. Now, as a church, our purpose remains the same. That never changes. It's very simple. We're called to love God and to love our neighbor. It's as simple and as hard as that. That's our purpose but every now and again, a church needs to work out how they're going to do that for their particular community at that particular time. And, and I guess what, the way that you kind of capture that in one sense is to say, what's our vision? What are we trying to make happen? What's our preferred future for this church and this community? And so we launch into a bit of a process as a church, asking God in particular what he might be calling us to do over the next five years, looking to the future. And we had two really key questions. What kind of church was he calling us to be? And I guess by that really we mean what kind of people is he calling us to be? Because the people are the church. But secondly, what is he calling us to do? We went through a little bit of a process of listening. If you were around at the time, about 18 months or so ago, you might remember the questionnaires that we did. Um, we also had conversations going on in, in smaller groups. Um, we had conversations at PC meetings over the past 18 months. We listened to one another. We also listen to our community and some of the groups that are working within our community as to the needs and some of the challenges that they face. We listen to some of the wider world issues and challenges that, and trends that we are seeing in the world around us. And most importantly, we listen to God. Because unless he builds the house, we labor in vain. 
After listening for a little while, we then went to a bit of a process, particularly as a PCC, of reflecting and dreaming and planning in response to all that we'd heard. And that kind of leads us to today. Uh, to, and I want to share with you where we're up to in this process now. And the, the story, the chapter, as it were, that I believe God is calling us to write here at Samaritus. And my hope really is that, uh, for two things. that The one that you would see your name in the story. And I guess what I mean by that is that if we've done our job well, in a sense, nothing here will really massively surprise you. It will resonate because you have helped to shape this. You have been a part of this process. You may not have been aware, but you have. So, so you will see your name, you'll see your character, you'll see yourself in this story. But secondly, and, and probably more importantly, you will see the part that you have to play going forward. Because each of us has a part to play. Um, so here we go. And in a sense, um, as I've prayed about this, I think you can sum this up in four words, our sort of vision. It's this. Come to the table. Come to the table. It's an invitation, I believe, from God to us. It's an invitation we're to extend to one another, and an invitation we're to extend to our community. Come to the table. What, what do I mean by that? Well, as we journey through this process, tables have become like a picture again and again of what I believe God is calling us and say, to do and saying to us and inviting us into and actually, as we went through this process, I started to notice how much tables featured in our life together. And I'm not saying that we're limited to what actually happens at these tables, but they're like a picture, and I hope you'll find this helpful. Um, each of these tables represents part of what God is calling us to do. So I'm just going to move around a little bit this morning. I hope that's okay. Um, so first thing, we've got the table of the Lord. This represents our calling to look upwards to God. To look to him. In a sense, this is where it all begins. All the stuff that we might feel called to do begins with his invitation to us. We're called to be people who look up because he has come down to us. In our reading, we had um, Jesus' words. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And the reason I chose that reading this morning is because it's a beautiful picture of what Jesus wants to do in each of our lives. It's perhaps easy to miss it, but in Jesus' culture, to to eat with someone was a sign, not just of sharing food and doing something functional, it was a picture of friendship, of welcome, of hospitality. To eat with someone was to say, I value you. You matter to me. I welcome you. Again and again in Jesus' ministry, he sits and eats with people, and it's so powerful. When he eats with people, it changes them and transforms them. It was restorative and and healing for those who were broken, um, who had made a mess of things. Eating with Jesus in some way changed them. Those who felt disconnected in being welcomed to a meal found connection. Those who were hurting found healing at the table. Through inviting people to eat with him, Jesus was saying, God welcomes you. God is for you. All that we're about and all that we want to be about starts with him. It starts with his invitation to us. And our vision really is to be a church family centered around the grace and welcome of God, who know that we are loved and held by him, and who live lives of worship in response to him. So my long is that, is that St. Melitus, we are a place marked by God's presence and life-changing power, where people can come to know and experience Jesus, to experience grace, be healed and transformed by him, and that our faith will be deepened as we walk with him. Now, each week in communion, uh, we pray this prayer, and we'll pray it a little bit later, but we pray this prayer, it says, come to this table. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and you need help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. We all connect with God in different ways. So some of you, that may be in, in, as we sing, and as we worship. Some of you, that may be as we pray together. For others, it might be with others over community. 
But each of you will connect with God in different ways. So please don't hear me that I'm saying that communion is the, is the only place where this happens. Remember, it's a picture. But it is a picture of God's invitation to us. And my longing is that you would be able to say, that I would be able to say, that our community would be able to say that when you go to St. Melitus, you meet with God. You meet with God. Jesus says, his invitation to us is, is come to the table. Our, our second part is our dining table over here. Let me just sit down, if that's okay. Um, this is about our calling to look inward. I'm going to stand up, actually. Our calling to look inward to one another, to be a family. You see, the vision is not just to be a church who does a couple of hours together on a Sunday. Our vision is to be a genuine family. A people who do life together, who look inward to one another. A diverse family that welcomes people from every sort of background, that embraces the mess of life, doesn't shy away from that, doesn't pretend that everything is perfect. At the family table, the dining table, everyone is welcome. Whatever stage or season you're in, to eat and share life together. A friend of mine has a saying, he says, your, your destiny is in your history. And one of the things that I know some of you know, but not everyone here will know, is that in the 1950s, uh, as West Indian migrants made their way to London, St. was the first church in Ealing to welcome those West Indian migrants. Where in other churches they weren't welcome, here they were welcome, and we have the legacy of that still today. But I think when something like that happens, that gets in the DNA of a church, we have this hot sense of hospitality and welcome that is intrinsic to who we are as a community and who we want to be. Our vision is to be a family where everyone is welcome. But it's more than that because a family is a place where you should be able to grow, where you can be encouraged, challenged at times as well. In a family, if you ever have a meal together, at their best, everyone plays a part, don't they? Maybe someone might cook it, but, but someone else might prepare the veg. Someone else might lay the table after the dinner. Someone else might have to be responsible for, for washing up. Everyone has a part to, play, part to play when you're a family. The dining table is a picture of our calling to look in to one another, to be the family of God here in Hamwell. And my longing is that people would serve St. Melitus. That's where you can go and find a family. That's where you can go and find a place to belong. And then we come to our final table, and we have the cafe table here. Um, and um, if you came here during the week, on pretty much any day, you would see this table and some of our other tables being used um, for different things. If you were here um, on Monday night, you would have seen them being used for uh, a money advice course that was being run by Crosslight. If you came on Wednesday morning, you would have seen food bank going on with these tables and other tables being used to help some of the most vulnerable in our community. If you came here on Thursday, you would have seen Ties and Tots, our toddler group going on. And, and in the afternoon, Baby and Me, our, our support group for, for um, new parents going on. If you came here on Friday, you would have Meet and Make going on, um, our group for those who want to gather around craft and build a family together. And then on Saturday, again, you would have seen food back going on. Again and again, these tables are used to serve our community. And for me, this speaks of our vision to look outward, to look beyond these four walls for the community and world around us. As we've listened to you and to our community, one of the things we've really realized is how much of a gift our building and location is. Thousands of people come past this building every day on the Oxford Road. Uh, we are right in the heart of Hamwell, and we have a calling to serve Hamwell, to serve particularly, I believe, those on the margins, those in need, those left behind, the last and the least, those forgotten. And our vision is to be a place where people from our community can find hope and healing connection with God and connection with others. A church that speaks up for the vulnerable and challenges injustice. 
And we recognize that in a, in a global society, at times, our neighbor's not just about you know, who lives next door to us, but can be someone across the world. And we recognize the call to be a church that engages wider than just our community as well. But the longing, my longing, is that people would say of St. Melitus that this community of Hamwell is a better place because we are here. That in some way we contribute to Hamwell flourishing because of our presence here as a church. Now at this point you might be saying, well that sounds really great, but what does that actually mean to you? Um, We're going to come to that in just a moment, but I just want to press pause as it were. And we've spoken about that desire to be a family. Um, and so this morning, I'm just encouraging you, we've already done it a little bit, but just to go, I'm going to hand some chocolates out. Jonathan, can I give you those? Oh, Chris, can I give you those? Take a chocolate, maybe give someone a chocolate. And this morning, we're going to have a names amnesty, because I know what it's like. I'm terrible with names. Um, if you take them, pass them along. Um, as a church grows, it can be hard and hard to know everyone. And maybe you've, you've noticed someone and thought, well, I've seen you around, but I don't actually know who you are. Maybe you've spoken to someone and you've forgotten their name. That happens to me all the time. Just for two minutes, I just encourage you to go and say hello to someone um, and they'll reconvene. And this is about us being that family, that call in to be inward and look to one another. So two minutes and we'll come back. Okay, do carry on those conversations after service. Um, I'm just going to move on a little bit now, because that, that's quite sort of like it's a picture of some of the sense of that we've had as a, uh, myself and the PCC of what the sort of church college is calling us to be, okay? So that's who we want to be. Look upward, look in, look out. Table of the Lord, dining table, cafe table. But what is he actually calling us to do as we move forward? Um, and um, again, we've been, do- over the last, this has taken probably 18 months or so of work at myself and the PCC listening. Um, and one of the things that's come out of that process of listening is five key priorities for us as a church. Um, so those five priorities. Firstly, following and leading. By that we mean following Jesus and leading others. The first call on each of us is to follow Jesus, to walk with him. And we've heard the desire within our church family to, as it were, have a deeper walk with Jesus. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of the ways that we want to help that to happen. At the same time, as we reflected together, we've realized if we're to keep growing and keep reaching our community, one of the things that we need within our church family is to encourage one another into helping and leading others, taking responsibility. Um, so we're going to be focusing on that as well. Secondly, building community. We've heard a desire with our church family to create more opportunities um, to come together, to build friendships. And I think particularly in the sort of aftermath of COVID with the isolation that came with that, that is a real challenge and issue. Um, But that, as I say, is particularly during the week that there's a desire for this to happen. Uh, Thirdly, what we're calling love your neighbor. I've spoken already of of that vision we have to reach those around us, to serve them, and to show them something of the love of Jesus. And fourthly, we've had children, youth, and family life. And this has been really a priority for us for a number of years now. We've seen some of the fruit of that. And we believe that uh, God is calling us to keep on pressing into this. And then finally, our building and our gardens. And we've heard a number of issues that we see um, in, with the building, but also a number of opportunities. I'm going to share some of that. And what the PCC and I have done, really, is to bring these five priority areas under each of the tables. If you don't get all this, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> like, um, it's more just a, a framework for us as the PCC to work out where we're going, where we should put our energy, our focus, and our resources. And I just want to say a few things at this point, because what I'm going to share this morning is not going to be comprehensive. The actual strategy document that we have for this is currently at eight pages. So you don't want to be here for the next hour and a half as I talk through that. So this is just broad brush strokes, okay? Um, And also I want to say that this is just a springboard. In a sense, like, we have ideas, but they're always evolving and developing. The world changes, and we know that it can happen just like that. 
but we, we don't want to see this as the finished thing. Vision is conti always continue uh, evolving. And also I want to say I want to be really honest with you in that there is a lot of faith involved if we are to see some of these things happen. They are beyond our capacity to make happen at this point in time because of the resources that they require in different ways. They require God to do something significant with us as a church. And if I'm honest, part of me is actually quite terrified <laughs> because once you put something out there, it's out there and you can't go back. But also as your leader, I'm really excited because it's always about trusting God, stepping out and trusting Him. Next week, I'm going to share a bit more about how we each will have a part to play in this and really focus in on that. So at this point, I'm just kind of sharing um, where we feel God is calling us to do. So let me take you back uh, to the table, as it were. And um, I'm going to share some of the things under these three tables, these three headings, which fit into these priorities. So firstly, the table of the Lord. We have this calling to look upward to God. What does that actually look like? Well, prayer and worship have to be the boiler room, as it were, of the church. Prayer and worship have to be right at the center of what we do. Nothing else can be sustained if we are not a people of prayer and worship, if we don't encounter him regularly. And we do that in the main through coming together. And so on Sundays, one of the things we're looking to do over the next few years is to encourage, train, and empower new service leaders, new preachers, to, to, so that it might reflect some of the diversity not only of our church, but our community. And we believe this is key, not just um, for adults, but for our children and young people, that they would have a place that they can come on a Sunday where they can encounter Jesus. So we're going to continue to invest in that. Um, you may not be aware, our accounts are freely available. They come around every APCM. We spend somewhere around 17 18% of our income on children's and youth and family life work. It's a huge investment, and we believe it's right to keep doing that. We employ Lucy as our children's and family pastor, and we're going to keep doing that. But as we grow, we realize that we may need to um, grow that team, as it were. And that's one of the things we're going to be considering as we move forward. One of the things that people said as we did those questionnaires is that they loved um, our worship, our sung worship in particular. And um, if you were here maybe a month or so ago on a Sunday you would have seen a 10, 11-year-old playing drums, a 15-year-old on piano, a 15-year-old on the sound desk, and two 10-year-olds 10, 10 playing cello. And for me, that's so exciting when that sort of thing's happening, encouraging and raising up the next generation of uh, people involved in our worship. So we want to grow and develop our Sundays, but, but also we want to see something grow during the week. So one of our hope is that we've developed a rhythm of prayer as a church where there's an opportunity to come together during the week um, and on other occasions for regular prayer meetings. We also want to develop a space in our building where people can come and pray at pretty much any time of day. More on that in just a moment. When it comes to building community, one of our values as well is that we believe that Ministry is so, so important. When we pray for people, things happen. So one of the things that I want to see happen in the next uh, year is, the, is for, to grow a team of people who would pray with others on a Sunday and feel confident in doing that. And then we come uh, to our building. Um, and at this point, I want to introduce our first um, building project. And... Um, as I said, these are things that we're hoping to happen over the next few years. Um, to be very honest, the financial climate right now is fairly challenging. Uh, so launching out on huge projects um, and doing fundraising of that is not what we're looking to do right now. But we are developing plans for two projects that I want to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, the first is to say this. One of the limitations of our building is that although it's a wonderful big space, we don't have any mid-size rooms. Um, a separate space so that when the building is used by other people, there's somewhere quiet that other, pe that, um, other things be going on. And I'm doing this under sort of the table of the Lord. I look upwards. Um, but it could apply, it will apply to other things, and I'll go into that in a moment. But 
but, but our, we are developing plans to, as it were, put walls on the chapel so that it becomes a separate space, a place of prayer, a quiet place, even when other things are going on in the building. And we want to see that. Uh, it, we'll do that really well, and we're, we're going to talk with the architect about that and how we do that. So that when that is used, it can be a place for worship, for people to meet with Jesus. And as part of that, I would love to see the opportunity for space in that room, for people to come and be able to sit during the week and have a quiet space to pray, to use prayer stations as much as we might do at 24-7 prayer when we do that. So that's our first project. We're developing plans for that at the moment. That's going to cost, at a low estimate, about £40,000, probably much more than that. Um, but we're, we're just in the early stages of doing that. I wanted to share that with you this morning. So that's the table of the Lord. Secondly, we have the dining table. And um, I just want to share something of our hopes and dreams as we move forward as a church for that. And, and really the main focus when it comes under following and leading for that is our small groups, our life groups. Uh, these happen during the week. It's where people meet together um, in each other's homes often uh, to look at the Bible together, to pray, to share life together. And we want to see these grow and develop. But we want to see different shapes and sizes. So at the moment, they all happen in the evening. One of the things we heard was that there was a desire for a weekday, uh, sorry, a, a, a life group that happened during the day for those who find evenings more difficult. We'd love to see that develop over the next year. And we want these life groups to be a place where people can grow in confidence in faith, but also a place where pastoral care can happen. Those who are in life groups often say to me that they feel really supported because they know they have a place where if something goes wrong, they've got a challenge in their life, they can share it straight away with someone. And they know both prayer and in practical ways they are supported. And as we grow as a church, one of the challenges is pastoral care. One or two people can't do that. In a sense, we care for one another. We don't just look to one person to provide that. And life groups are right at the heart of that. Uh, when it comes to building community, one of the initiatives that we are developing is that alongside that sense of wanting to come together to be able to journey in faith together, was a longing just to come and to share life together, to have a place during the week on a weekday to come together. So uh, an idea that's being developed by a group at the moment is to have a, a weekday um, lunch social, it's called. And the simple idea really is very simple, to bring people together, perhaps on a fortnightly basis, to have soup or sandwiches, uh, followed by maybe some sort of different activity that rotates. It could be games, it could be films, it could be a speaker every now and again. What people have, might, whatever people might have a passion for. So we're looking to develop a, a weekday lunch social. When it comes to building community and love your neighbor, one of the things that's really key well, to all of this really is communication. And one of the things that we've heard as well is that we need to communicate better about what is going on in church. So we're developing uh, some of those. We've restarted our um, paper notice sheets, but you can also get them online. And really, if possible, um, if you use um, the internet, we'd encourage you to get that because it obviously it saves paper. But we want to develop other ways of communicating what's going on. That's why we're starting to use the screens at the back so that during the week people can see what's going on. Um, and alongside that, one of the things that's hugely changed over the past two years is the importance of your church website. Um, in a sense, because of the last two years and we've been through, your church website is now your front door. It's the way people will check out your church to see what's going on. And we want to work on our website to grow and develop that to make sure that it helps people um, to get a picture of who we are and to get involved in what we do. And then finally, um, well not finally, so under love your neighbor, um, as it were, we will often do big project, uh, big sort of gatherings together. We've got our international meal in a few weeks' time. We do other things. We've done a barbecue in the summer. But also we want to emphasize the importance of keeping things simple. And actually as a small group, there'll be the opportunities. We're going to set aside some budget for small groups to be able to go and serve someone in their community in a simple way might be doing some decorating or some gardening. Some way of when you know someone who uh, perhaps lives along your road or in your community, your friendship group, and you can say to your small group, maybe we could go and help them in some way. As a church, we're resourcing that to happen. 
and then building in God. And when it comes to looking inward, I've always men already mentioned uh, the chapel as a separate space um, and enabling that to, um, to be a room. That obviously means that we've then got another room for use during the week for perhaps when a smaller group um, is meeting 15 people or so. They can meet in there. It's a nice space to meet rather than having to fill the whole church. It's also cheaper to heat as well. <laughs> I say that at that point. We also heard that we need to enhance the lighting in this building, that um, during the evenings and in the winter, it's quite difficult to see. So we'll look into plans to do that and how we might do that. But then that brings you to kind of the second project we want to see um, happen over the next few years. Um, and that's to develop um, our entrance into church. For me, one of the things that's really important is that our building and our gardens reflect who we are as a community. If we want to be a welcoming community, our building needs to reflect that. It needs to have an openness to people coming in. Um, so one of the, the plans that we're developing at the moment, again, it's in the early stages, is to develop a welcome area as you come into church. That will probably involve moving the cupboard that's at the back there to elsewhere in the building, so there's still that storage space. But that when you come in, it feels like an open space. And in a deliberate area, people can see what Simulitis is about. Uh, with notice boards, with someone to meet you, more on that in just a moment. Um, but also to put glass doors into church. And again, that links um, to another project that we have that I'll come to in just a bit. But so that with glass doors, you can see into the building. It's also, if you think about it, putting glass doors in there is actually um, really help with our safety as a church. When there's a group in here um, and they're using the church, and anyone can walk in off the street, which is... Um, can be great sometimes, but also presents its challenges. At the moment, the only options are either to close the door um, or to have them open. With a glass door, there's the opportunity to lock the door, um, and then people, if they come, they can see who's there before they decide whether it's right for them to come in or not. I hope that makes some sort of sense anyway. So we're looking at developing a welcome area into church. Um, again, more detail on this next week, but uh, we know that's probably going to cost around £20,000 or so to do that. The doors being the main cost of that. Um, but they're moving the cupboard elsewhere in the building, putting some notice um, boards in and different things so that there's a sense of people come in and they, they have a, an anchor. They know how to find out what's going on uh, for us as a church. And then finally, um, very quickly, um, we've got our calling to look outward, to love our neighbor. So when it comes to following Jesus, we want to create opportunities for people to have to explore faith. None of this, well, this stuff hopefully helps people to connect with Jesus. And so for me, one of the things I really want to see us do is create opportunities for that. For sometimes that may be through a course. Other times that may just be in informal conversations. One of the ideas I'm developing for the next, probably uh, in Lent time, is a, a sort of tough questions group. An opportunity to come and it could be people within the church or even in the church. You've got a tough question Let's come, let's chat about it, let's explore it together, whatever that might be. It could be why is there suffering in the world or, you know, whatever I feel painfully, <laughs> um, I feel is going to inflict maximum pain on me. Um, so we want to, yeah, be a people who enable people to explore faith. Building community. Loneliness is in many ways the hidden epidemic of our time. Time and time again, we hear the statistics of people who feel isolated and alone. And um, we want to be a church that builds community. How do we connect and serve our local community? We obviously have our bigger groups and our bigger gatherings. But one of the things we're going to start to do is develop what I'm calling interest groups. Um, groups which meet, um, maybe for just a particular short period of time, but, or could be just going on the whole time interest groups, um, and actually we already have some of these. So if you're a member of Meet and Make, um, if you are part of the Mother's Union, uh, if you've gone to any of the Gather Together dances, in a sense these come under interest groups. Groups which might meet together you know, weekly, monthly, for a short period of time, but focused around an interest. And the beauty of those is it could be anything. And this is where we all maybe have a part to play. So maybe you have a passion for baking or for cycling, maybe you love video games, you could create an interest group. And it's a way of drawing people in, building community and friendship. 
One particular group that we want to start is a walking group, a group that meets maybe once a month, maybe starting here at Simulitis, a, a guided walk perhaps around the local area. Very simple idea, but a way of inviting others um, to build community. L love your neighbor. Um, we really want to develop our partnership with the food bank. Thousands of people come through these doors every year, um, being served by uh, Elim Food Bank. They also have developed now a debt advice um, service, and that goes on on Wednesdays in this building as well. Um, and we really want to partner with them in the best way possible to enhance and to help what they do. One of the particular things that they are saying to us at the moment is they would love to restart their cafe that happened pre-COVID alongside people coming to get food. So alongside coming to get food, um, they'd be served tea, coffee, a bit of cake, and be able to have a chat with someone. They would love us as a church to, if possible, help that to restart. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking into at the moment. The other thing that we're definitely going to do in January is the Ealing Church's Winter Night Shelter. It's not happened as it had done historically over the past few years. It did happen last year in a slightly different format. But they are going back um, this winter to their, um, their pro a previous way of doing things where churches would host over the winter uh, a number of people who are homeless um, to sleep overnight, provide food, a warm space, um, and, a, and a base for them to then go and to find and to grow their lives. And we're going to be doing that over four Monday nights in January and love to invite you to be part of that. Alongside that, we have our global partnerships. If you don't know, we've got relationships with um, a, part, uh, a project in Rwanda and another project in Kenya. And one of the things we'd love to see over the next few years is trips to go out to those projects, to learn from them, to listen to what's going on, to share that with our church family. I could go on, but the time is running out. Um, so two last things I want to say. Um, children and youth. Um, we already, as I said, invest massively in this. On Thursdays, it's all about our community, serving them. We've got our toddler group and our baby group. Um, but, but also, we know there are other opportunities there. One of the needs is for help with parenting, and we'd love to develop a parenting course. Well, we have a parenting course that we will run at some point to help those in our community who want to grow those skills as parents. We'd love to hold an alpha course for those who come to that, uh, for those who come to those groups. Alongside that, sorry, I've missed this out, but one of the things we want to grow and develop is a welcome team, not just doing a welcome area, but when you come into church on a Sunday, people are welcoming you, saying hello to you, making you feel comfortable as you come into this place. And then finally, um, I want to talk about our gardens. Uh, we actually have two gardens. Um, you may or may not be aware of that. We also have a garden out the back here. Um, you will know that we've, for many years now, before my time, um, had a project with the council to um, develop this garden, to reopen it. It's not a safe space at the moment, unfortunately, but we want to, they have, they are, ha we have, we have funding from them, it's their money, um, to develop the garden in such a way that it can be opened, uh, that it can be a safe space to kind of walk through, well lit, um, and so on. We are still working with them on that. It ha I know you don't hear very much about it, but there are conversations going on. When it happens, there'll be a space at the, on the Uxbridge Road uh, with a path which then leads pretty much like past the front door. Uh, lots of the fencing will remain on this side and on that side, but there'll be three separate spaces um, where people can come across. The idea is to, as I said, for our garden to reflect who we are as people, to be welcoming and inviting. That's our front garden. That will bubble on and we'll hopefully get there. We have a design. They're just budgeting things going on. Our back garden at the moment is, is actually from Honest's wasteland, really, in many ways. Um, but it's an untapped space. Um, so our eco team, our, our group who are, who are helping us to think about how we care for environment, they would love to develop that as a space uh, where it could be a beautiful oasis, um, pot potentially growing fruit and vegetables, which then can tie into some of the other things we can do. Alongside that, we we would love to create an area where children can come and play who perhaps we know from Ties and Tots and Baby and Me 
lots of people who come don't have an outside space at home. Um, and so have a small space out there where whatever the weather, they can come and play outside. Um, I don't have time to go into everything else. Um, and I know that I've gone on a long time. Um, but hopefully you hear something of my heart and our vision for this place. As I said, lots of these things are things which are beyond us at the moment in terms of resources. But each of us has a part to play in them. And hopefully what I've done is set out our priorities and our, our direction of travel, as it were. We're called, this is our purpose, to love God and to love our neighbor. But over the next five years, I want us to be a people who have that refrain in our heads, come to the table. Come to the table. It's the invitation from Jesus. And our vision really is that each one of us will be able to say, this is a place where you can come and meet with God. It's also a vision we're called to extend to one another. Come to the table. Come to the dining table, as it were that people might say this is a, a place where you can find a family, a place to belong. Come to the table. We extend that invitation to our community. The longing is that people would say that Hamwell is a better place to live and work because of our presence here. So friends, that's our vision. And my, this is my invitation to you. Come and be a part of this. Everyone has a part to play. Next week, as I said, I'll be sharing a bit more about what that might look like. But come and be a part of this. And I believe God is going to do something significant, as he has done. As I said at the right beginning, this is just the next chapter. For many, many years, God has been at work in this church. The last 112, I think it is. I've lost count. God has been at work. But our calling again and again is to ask what's next, Lord. What do you want to do in us and through us? I want to invite you to stand. Um, I've gone a long time today. But in a moment, we're going to share communion because it feels like that's the right way to finish our service. But let me pray for us, and then Ellie's going to come and lead us in a simple song, and then we're going to lead into communion. Lord, we look to you. This is your church, not ours. We thank you for all that you've said to us over the past year or so. And Lord, we pray today, we lay these plans, these hopes before you and pray that you would build your kingdom here as we prayed earlier. That your kingdom come and your will be done in Hanwell as it is in heaven, in St. Melitus as it is in heaven. And Lord, we, I pray for each one of us that you would show us the part that we have to play in this. Thank you that you invite each of us to play a part. Would you lead us on? As a church, we pray.